covered uh, FDMA and TDMA. Uh, this is the third major scheme it's, uh, that is used in satellite communication. It's a CDMA, this uh, special version of a spread spectrum technology called co-division multiple access. So today I'm going to go over and explain how this, the CDMA work. And then we'll see that there are some distinct advantages and some distinct disadvantages of using CDMA. Uh, you will see that it has a place in satellite communication only in some special circumstances where, uh, and we're going to talk about when that's the case. So first, let's explain CDMA principles. This is a, a little um, drawing that uh, it's kind of very simplified. Uh, uh, to say the analogy of what these access streams are, but it's a very good one. You know, it, it, even, even though it's simple, it illustrates clearly what the concepts are. In FDMA, you're physically separating every single communication. So every one of the users have its own portion of the spectrum. And essentially, they are not interacting with one another. We, that's, that's the story that we had in terrestrial communication, and it's true there. In satellite, it is not completely true. Why? Because they're all going through the same hardware, same amplifier, and because the hardware might be non-linear, they may be cross-talk, right? But in general, you start with an idea that everybody is in a separate room having their own conversation. In TDMA, everybody is in the same room. They're using the same frequency, but they're talking one at a time, right? Now, in CDMA, everybody is on the, in the same room. Everybody is talking at the same time but they're using different codes. Their conversations are encoded in a, separate, in, in a specific way using orthogonal codes so that, uh, so that the receiver can actually, by correlating all of the signals with appropriate code, extract the information that is pertinent to a particular conversation. Out of all of these three analogies, this one is the most appropriate. And a lot of things intuitively about CDMA we can understand by going back to, to this room. This is by sometimes also referred to as, as a, a cocktail party, right? Where you have a lot of conversations going on at the same time. But, but let me give you some example why this is a great analogy for, for understanding CDMA. It follows right from this picture that it is very important to control the power of your signal in CDMA. Why? Think about what happens if one of these two, uh, one of these uh, conversations, people start yelling. Yeah, the noise in the room goes up. It will cause everybody else to yell. The, and, and pretty soon, it gets so loud that everybody is yelling, but nobody hears each other. So that's why you know power control is extremely important. What happens if you lose orthogonality? Let's say there is somebody talking. You know, not bilingual, but let's say you have Portuguese and Spanish going on at the same time. There will be a crosstalk because the, the, the codes are similar, and then and then you will hear parts of the conversations that you're not going to be able. The, the the most distinct the languages are, the most easier it's going to be to understand. So a lot of these things that are that are in that you know when you need to reason will come out by remembering this picture. That's why I put it all the way it has a. You know, at this stage of, of your life, it's kind of trivializing things. Okay, so here's the, the how does the CDMA transmission work? This is uh, looking at uh, uh, the transmission from, let's say, Earth station to another Earth station through a transponder. And how does it work? Well, here, here are the bits that I need to send, my symbols, the information that I'm trying to send to the other end. Now, in CDMA, before the data are sent to the RF piece of the transmitter, the data are spread. Or what that means, they are multiplied by a, another binary sequence that has a, a rate that is much larger than the rate of, the, of your information. Let me give you an example. Let's say you're signaling with one kilobit per second, and your, your spreading sequence, or the bit sequence that you're going to multiply your, your, your information, is going to be one megabit per second. Thousand times larger, or something of that order. Uh, why do we do that? Well, this is where the language comes in. At the, uh, you know, at the bit, bit rate or the data rate, everybody talks the same language. You are sending bits from the other end to the one end to the other. By multiplying this 
with a specific uh, sequence here, you're actually making this orthogonal to every other signal that is out. These sequences are going to be a language sequences and they'll have to have this special property of orthogonality. They go back and address them. But for right now, just remember that you have your bitrate here, which is what you're trying to send on the other side, multiplied with a sequence that's of a much higher rate. To distinguish between bitrate and this small bitrate, we call these small bit chips. Right, so, so we have chip rate, right? Because what is a chip? A small bit, right? So we talk about the ratio of the chip rate and the bit rate. Now, this process is called spreading. Why is it called spreading? Because we see it in a frequency domain. If you take the Fourier transform of these, let's say these are square passes, what do you get? You get sync. sync. But you get sync here as well. But when you look at these two sinks, what's different between them? The, the width in the frequency domain. This one is spread more in the frequency domain. If you multiply two signals in a time domain, what is it that you're doing in a frequency domain? You're convolving. So what you're actually happening is this sink is, is convolved with this sink. And because this one is much more wider, it essentially, essentially the, the footprint in the frequency domain is dictated by this sink. So if you look at the signal after being multiplied, and you look at it in the frequency domain, its footprint in the frequency domain is much bigger. So we say we're spreading the signal across much, much higher, much higher, much larger frequency range. So that's the process that happens at the transfer. Now, after that, pretty much the rest is the same as what we've done so far. You know, you have some, some ones and zeros coming in. They go through some shaping filter to make them in analog domain. You put them on a carrier. You multiply, amplify them, send them through the antenna, they bounce back from the transformer to the antenna. You strip the carrier, bring them down to the basement, and then this from here to here is nothing but RF modem. You send a signal from one end and hopefully what comes out of the other end that looks like the thing that you sent, right? Plus the noise and plus the interference and all the other junk that you picked up along the way. Now, how do I recover my bits back? Well, you have to de now deploy, uh, employ correlation here. You have to correlate what is coming in with the proper sequence. So at the receiver, we have to use the same sequence that we use for spreading. We have to use this to disperse. And if, when you multiply this, if you align them correctly in time, this sequence will be such that by doing this, you're going to eliminate this code. And what will come out is your bit sequence. So that's the main idea. Now. If you were to use a single point-to-point -point link, then you, you're going to look at this and say, why in the world that I'm doing this? I mean, if, if this was a single link, why am I messing with spreading this spread? It doesn't seem to add anything. What you don't see in this picture is that there is another one of these using the same transponder to the same frequency, same frequency band. So what happens is you put these spread signals on the top of each other. They are there at the same time, in the same frequency band, interfering with each other completely. It's just like all the conversation in the cocktail party. We are all in the same baseband here, 0 to 4 kilohertz. Everybody's talking at the same time, so nobody's enforcing any discipline. But and all the signals combined will reach this guy here. It is the process of this spreading that will enhance your signal and suppress all the others so you can demodulate. Correct. So to illustrate how that is happening, let's walk through a couple of users and see how this would work. So that's this whole picture that I had on the previous slide, but I took out the RF mode, right? I don't need, that's just whatever is the analog signal, I assume it happens on the other side. Let's just look at the process of spreading and displaying. So here I have an example of two users. This guy is trying to send one. This guy is trying to send minus one. Right? They're going to use the same channel at the same time. Right? How are they going to do that? Well, I'm going to take this signal, this one here, and multiply that by the spreading code that has 1111. What's the chip rate here? It is four times the bit rate uh, of, of this guy. So instead of sending 1, I'm going to send 1111. Here, instead of sending minus 1, I'm going to multiply this minus 1 with the spreading code of this guy, which is going to be 1, 1, minus 1, minus 1. So when you multiply it, it becomes minus 1, minus 1, 1, 1. 
So th these are now four chips here and four chips here, and I'm just going to simply add them together, right? So I add them and I put them on a the channel. If you look at signal here, it doesn't look like any one of these signals. It's the mixture. That's the mixture of what you hear in the room, right? So that signal appears on the other end, and then I have two receivers. The first receiver is trying to uh, demodulate signal coming from the first user, and the second receiver is trying to demodulate the signal coming from the, from the second user. The first receiver has a knowledge of the spreading sequence that was used by the transmitter, right? So it knows that whatever is intended to me was encoded by a spreading sequence 1111. So I'm going to take whatever, I, whatever comes, this aggregate signal, multiply it by 1111 and integrate it. And if that number is bigger than 0, I'm going to decide that it was 1 that was sent. If that number is smaller than 0, I'm going to decide that it was minus 1 that was sent. So the first guy multiplies with 1111, gets 0 plus 0 plus 2 plus 2, which is 4 greater than 0. The decision is it has been 1 that was sent. Right? The other guy is going to multiply the same signal, 0, 0, 2, 2, now with the spreading sequence C2. So it is 0 times 1, 0, 0 times 1, 0, minus 2 times minus 1, uh, no, sorry, 2 times minus 1, it's minus 2, and 2 times minus 1 is minus 2, and it will add all of them together to get minus 4. So the decision here is, oh, this is smaller than 0, so it has been minus 100 percent, right? And then the next four chips, it's going to do the same, and the next four chips, it's going to do the same. So this is how you can use the same exact physical line or the same exact physical transponder for multiple signals that, and, and yet recover information at the end. The ratio between the chip rate and bit rate, like in this case, what is that ratio? 4 to 1, right? Yeah. It's called processing gain. It's usually expressed in dBs. And it, and it tells us uh, how many, how large is the spreading, right? Here I spread the four times, right? Four. And you will see that a lot of performance aspects of CDMA are directly tied to the processing gain. We look at the capacity and all the other things and we see that it's directly related to the processing gain. Now, it should be obvious from our discussion here that there is something really special about these spreading sequences, about this language, something that makes them uh, possess this very uh, precious quality of being orthogonal. What does orthogonal mean? Orthogonal means that their dot product is equal to zero. So let's take the dot product of these two guys. One times one plus one times one plus one times minus one plus one times minus one. What is it? Zero. zero. So those are, these are, these are special codes. As a matter of fact, these guys are called Walsh codes and, and they're, they're orthogonal. The catch with the Walsh codes is they have to be aligned. You know, if I, if I take this one and slide it by one chip, then, then they're becoming non-orthogonal. So we are in a search of a special class of codes that are orthogonal for, for any delay between them. Because remember what we're doing, we're transmitting from, from uh, different locations on the ground. And the reason why we use CDMA is because we don't want to synchronize them, right? So we want to have codes that are orthogonal by themselves regardless of what, their sh what the shift between them is, right? And uh, these are what we call noise-like code sequences. And there's a group of, a group of these sequences uh, gold codes, Kasami sequences, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to present what is called M sequences or PN sequences, and all the others are kind of derived from these sequences. So let's just look at uh, M sequence and uh, explain how that works. Okay, so before I do that, let's just explain how the CDMA access works. You have multiple earth stations. Each one of them will spread their own signals across the pretty much the entire bandwidth allocated for the transponder short of the guard bands and, and what, uh, what needs to be there to protect the adjacent channels. And then they're going to send those two signals, all of their signals simultaneously over the same frequency. They're not going to even, uh, they're not going to particularly care what the other ones are doing, which 
I, I'm saying that way right now, but I'll go back to this statement because you will see it will matter that they need to be power managed. You cannot remember our, our room thing, you know, because they are now at the same frequency at the same time. None of them should be screaming, right? Because that, that mean, makes the other ones uh, a scream as well. So they're all going to be managed at the lowest power required to complete the link. Power control is an essential part of the CDMA access key. And if you look at the power spectral density of the transponder, it's the signals on the top of each other. This whole signal exists simultaneously. The transponder is sending one signal. So I am products and all of that is non-significant non, uh, here because you have only one signal that, uh, that you're occupying, even though it consists of multiple signals. All right, so, uh, so what are the PN sequences? They have what is called noise-like autocorrelation properties. Now, if you think about noise, what does the autocorrelation of the noise look like? Well, if you look at noise as a really wideband signal, flat, meaning constant in the frequency domain, what is the autocorrelation function? It's the inverse Fourier transform of their power spectral spec density. If the power spectral density is constant, what's the autocorrelation function? Delta. It's a delta, delta. function. So we're looking at, uh, at to find out binary sequences that have this kind of autocorrelation, so that when you align the sequence with itself, obviously you get very high correlation. But even if you're s slipped by one bit, you get the sequence that is orthogonal to the sequence that it started from. Fortunately, we find those sequences. They're, they're called uh, M sequences or PN sequences here. And they're generated, you know, they're generated in software. But, you know, conceptually, they're generated by what is called a shift register. A shift register is a guy like this that has N different uh, uh, or here are different uh, flip-flops and then you generate the input to the shift register by taking some of these tabs and running them through module 2 better and then feeding them back and this ends up being a periodic sequence generator where if you pick those tabs here judiciously you actually end up with a sequence of the maximum length the maximum length is going to be 2 to the number of tabs minus 1 and uh, these tabs are, you know, there's some theory. You can find, I put this in here. Uh, you can find uh, much more theory on, on them here. But there's special places where you put these tabs. It turns out that you need to know something that's called primitive polynomials in you know, field number two. It's all explained in here. It's, it's uh, usually part of coding theory. Right? And, and uh, we're, we're not going to spend much time here. but. Through a structure like this, you can generate a sequence that has these properties, that has a noise-like autocorrelation property. Uh, now, the majority of these places where they explain, they're going to give them in a, what is called field of two, just zeros and ones. When we work with them in the analog world, in our world, that then one maps into minus one and zero maps into one. That, and then what, what, what is here, the module two addition ends up being simple multiplication in, in our world. So uh, to kind of, you know, not go into this theory a lot, there is an explanation on the properties of these sequences. Um, I'm just going to leave this, you know, without much, you know, there's too much text here. What I'm going to do is, uh, I have embedded here itself, let's hope it works, that has one such sequence. And uh, uh, it's going to be a challenge for you guys to see. Is it challenging already, or can you see it now? Oh, oh, can you see it now? <laughs> I can see clearly now. There's a song, right? The rain is gone. But it's it's really raining outside. That's a lot. Let's see. Okay. So let's let's look at this sequence. Here. All right. So this is the sequence of the length of fifteen. Fifteen is two to the what? Two to the four minus one. All right, so this would be gen this sequence could be generated with a shift register that has four different flip flops, 
for taps, and if you feed them in the proper place, you're going to get this sequence. Uh, here's how. I need to go upstairs. Here's how this sequence looks like. It is minus one, minus one, minus one, 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 you know, ones and minus ones. You know, <coughs> nothing impressive, right? Only just a bunch of ones and minus ones. Now, what, what you have here is the shift of that sequence. And we're, when we say shift, we're talking about psychic shift. And you've done those shifts way long. You know, you know how you do shift, everything would would uh, either click, let's say in this case, it clicks one up and then whatever goes here comes back at the downstairs. So this is the cyclic shift for zero, right, which is a trivial shift. It's the same as the sequence itself. Then I move this up, so this, this you can see these three ones now become two and this minus one from here comes at the bottom, right? And then you can have how many of these shifts before you repeat? Fifteen. Right? 15 times and, and everything comes back. Now, what uh, is interesting to now define what we call autocorrelation. Right? Autocorrelation comes from a different lab. So if I want to take the autocorrelation, I will take the original sequence, take the dot product with its shifting version, divide by n to normalize it, and I would get always a number. So how do I take the dot product? Minus 1 times minus 1 plus minus 1 times minus 1 plus and so on. 1 times 1, right? Since I have all of them the same, this would be 15 divided by 15 is going to be 1. For, for 0 lag, my autocorrelation is going to be 1. But if I shift by 1, then I have minus 1 times minus 1 plus minus 1 times minus 1 plus minus 1 times 1 and so on, right? And the question is what these, these correlations for different legs end up being. And uh, if you now look at what's in the bottom part, is the essentially just the multiplication, right? If you multiply, you get all ones here. You get some ones and minus ones and so on. And if you sum all of this and divide by, by the total number of uh, bits in the sequence, you get the surprising thing. You get that. For zero leg, as we expected, the autocorrelation function is one. But for all the other legs, it's some small negative number. It turns out that number is minus one over n, where n is the length of the sequence. So this is minus one over 15. Now, 15 is a relatively short sequence, right? So this number is 7%, right? But if the sequence was of you know, the length, let's say, 1,023, then this becomes 1,000 times smaller than 1. It's practically 0, because that's, that kind of goes into a noise. So you have a sequence that has this beautiful autocorrelation property that for 0 lag, it, it is, it, correlation is 1. But for every other shift, the autocorrelation function is practically 0. The look of it is, is some, something like, like this, right? Now, what uh, I did here is, uh, what I did here, I did calculations for the discrete, discrete legs, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6, and so on, right? It was a leap of faith for me to connect these dots, right? Because you don't really know if, you know, based on what I just said, that, uh, that uh, this would happen, you know, in a, in a, in a field of two. Uh, this wouldn't even make us make any sense, right? What's the shift of 1.3, right? But if you translate these into analog pulses, right, and you translate 1 into minus 1 and 0 into 1, and you do the analog articulation, you actually show up, show that you can connect these dots like this. So in an analog world, this is what the articulation function looks like. So it is, it is noise. Now, if I take two bits. One is now from the first user and the second user. Instead of using those, those uh, uh, Walsh codes that I used in the slide, I use now PN sequence, but uh, over different legs, I'm going to still uh, uh, preserve the orthogonality for 
large number of delays. You know, if I'm unfortunate that delays kind of is so large that it makes the two sequence align, then then I may lose orthogonality. But most of the time, by management of these PN assignments, you can actually make the signals coming from different different users orthogonal, right? Orthogonal to the to the large degree, the degree of the processing. Okay. Typically, the sequences are much larger than, than 15. I use 15 here so that I can illustrate the, the concept. But uh, you know, and you, you've seen that even 15 was almost too large for the screen that I have to deal with. So here's what the summary. You have these uh, sequences that have the autocorrelation function that is equal to 1 for leg equal to zero, and minus one over n for every leg that's different than zero. So that means they're practically orthogonal to every delayed version of itself, which is a really, really noble property that they possess. And these are the sequences that we're going to use for encoding signals from different stations. Go ahead. So, um, what different L stations have um, different lengths for the yeah. PN sequence? Do they all have to have the same length? What if like, a different L station is transmitting with different lengths. Okay. Um, uh, why would they have that that's that's a that's a good question, but th that's not how it's done, right? Here's what what is the uh, remember our story about how how spreading and dispreading is done. This is the bandwidth of your transponder. Of transponder, right? Now, here's where I need to fit my signal, right? So, what is it that I'm doing? I'm, I'm having my baseband signal. Let's say this is my baseband signal, which where this here is proportional somehow to your bit rate, right? Then you're gonna convolve this with your spreading sequence that will have the bandwidth proportion, proportional to your chip rate. And you would fit that in the band, in this guy. So in systems with a CDMA access, you keep your chip rate the same. Right? So they're all going to be, why? Because the chip rate is what dictates how large is, this, is your footprint of the signal in the frequency domain. If you start changing chip rate, what is it that you're doing? You're actually having signals that are of a different band. And although this can be done, I, I don't know example of where it's done. Most of the time, you keep the chip rate the same, but uh, so that the spreading here is the same. So if this is your signal, the next signal is like on the top, and the third signal is on the top. They all have the same chip rate. Now, there is not a requirement that the bit rate is the same, right? And as a matter of fact, that's done. So what you, what you end up having is the chip rate is maintained the same. Let's say I set the chip rate, uh, um, let's say 3.84 times 10 to the 6 chips per second. But then I have multiple bit rates. I can have a bit rate of 512 kilobits per second, or I have a bit rate of 9.6 kilobits per second. Right? that are both going to be spread to this chip rate, that are going to be multiplied. Now, if you look at what is happening here, this is what's happened. This is the bit in a, in the first case. This is the bit in the second case. All, both of them are multiplied with a chip rate that is much larger in a, in a right. So they're both spread to this same bandwidth. But the processing gain, in this case, is going to be much smaller than the processing gain this case. And what this will translate is that this signal needs to have much more power to be able to modulate the same bit error it is this one. So so it is not the way how, how, how you're saying that it's done. It, you keep the chip rate the same. Bit rate might be variable. But then, you know, what happens as a result of that, for the signals that are of the higher bit rate, they have to have higher power than the signals of the lower bit rate because they have a less of a processing gain. Okay. 
Um, what was I to say? Okay. So let's um, look at now uh, how how do I calculate the capacity of how much of a, of a, how many signals can I overlay in a signal transform? Like how how many CDMA signals I can have? Let me just uh, draw a picture so that we remember what is going on here. Here are all of your uh, Earth stations, and they're all talking to the satellite here. And then the satellite is sending back the signal. Let's say here I'm receiving the signal, let's say A, talking to this guy here, A prime, right? So what is formed here is the signal that is in a bandwidth of the transponder that has all of these three signals simultaneously, right? So this is the signal from A, this is the signal from B, and this is the signal from C. And this guy here is going to receive this entire signal where all of the signals are being mixed, and it will have to demodule the, the, the process this so that it gets back the signal A and reject the signals B and C. So if you look at what is happening um, here, um, if uh, the way how it works, you, you, you can define uh, signal to noise ratio at the output of this receiver, right? Signal to noise ratio for the signal A. And that signal to noise ratio is going to be whatever is the carrier to noise ratio for a given signal. Uh, C to N, but it should really be, let me just, uh, I have it C to N over there. Let me keep it C to N. It's C to N in your book, spread spectrum, I guess, plus the 10 log of your processing. Now, let me explain pictorially what is happening. When you, when you take this signal and you're going to convolve this with a PN sequence of A, what will happen? Well, you're taking all of these uh, signals here and you're multiplying them with, a, uh, with this sequence A. Now, only one of them is encoded with this sequence. So only one of them will have complete alignments, right? Where this one is one, this one is one, and this one is minus one. So when you multiply, you always get ones, right? Because one times one is one, and minus one times minus one is one. So what happens as a result of this, the signal is being dispread. But which signal is being dispread? These guys, they say they, they remain spread because the B and C remain spread. Um, so this is B and C. Let me actually draw this. So B and C, they remain spread. Why? Because their PS sequence and this one are different, right? So the, the, and the, let's say they're a different phase of the same sequence. So the, what happens is when you multiply different phases of the same PS sequence, you get that sequence again, it's just a different phase. Of it. And the signal A is going to be this spread, right? So it's going to be now in the basement. So this here is going to be proportional to the chip rate. And this here is going to be proportional to the bit. So now, after this spreading, you're going to put a low pass filter that get rid, gets rid of all the other ones, all the, all the energy that is outside the baseband. And then you can see that your, that your signal is now uh, above the total noise and interference created by the other users in the system. This is your signal-to-noise ratio in the output. And uh, the improvement that you get from this, we call processing gain. This is not really power amplification. Here, you're not power amplifying anything. You're redistributing the power spectrum density of your signal. By multiplying the signals B and C with the P and sequence A, you are not dispreading them, because they have different spreading points. So they're, they're left spread, their energy is spread across this wide band. Now, the signal A is special. Why? Because it's spread with this particular PN sequence. So when you multiply it with this PN sequence, you're going to dispread it, or you're going to bring its energy from this wide band into the base band, right? 
you're going to actually start seeing those bits, and those bits are going to move at a higher, at a much lower rate than your chip rate, so their frequency content is going to be at the base rate. Now, the energy of A is the same in both cases. The, the power is the same in both cases, but the power spectral density is different. Here, the power spectral density is focused in narrow band around the orange. And by placing the, placing the low pass filter, you can, you're able to reject pretty much all of the energy that, that belongs to other users and just let the one that belongs to the particular user go through. This, this process, this gain that you get here, the improvement in the signal to noise ratio is processing gain. It's gain due to your process, so not because you are amplifier and, and that gain is this ratio of the chip rate over bit rate. You can see that, why is that ratio important? Because if you say that this is RC, you say the power in both cases is the same. But what is the power? The power is the power spectral density essentially times the band. So this is going to be PSD before spreading, before, times the RC. And this is going to be equal PSD after spreading times RD. So these two are the same. So you get that the PSD after spreading is going to be PSD before spreading times RC over RB, right? So your, your power spectral density now in the base band is improved by this ratio. The power spectral density of everybody else this still stays the same, so therefore you're improving your power spectral density, you're improving your signal to noise ratio over this narrower band of frequencies, right? If you were to look at across the wide band, you didn't do anything. You just redistributed the energy. But because you're now looking over narrow band of frequencies, but you're rejecting the, the rest of it, you're improving your, your signal to noise ratio. And that improvement is given in this equation here. Now, how do I determine the capacity? I'm going to assume that I'm having Q identical base uh, air stations <coughs> communicating. So now we're looking at this, this term here. What does that term consist of? And I can say that this is a C, or I should write in a, in a DB domain as 10 log of your carrier power divided by Q minus 1, because all the other guys are going to act like your interferes. And then there's going to be some noise that is, you know, thermal noise always present, that is of the same nature, right? It's, it's a wideband signal sitting below all of these signals, right, as, uh, as, as your total loss. Uh, plus 10 log of your RC over RP. Now, in, uh, in uh, CDMA systems, we're going to use certain modulation scheme, encoding scheme. And this will dictate what this signal to noise ratio afterwards needs to be. If I'm using, let's say, DPSK, and I'm shooting for 10 to the minus 6, uh, uh, Beta rate, then I have to have a signal to noise ratio afterwards around 10 dB. That's what gives you uh, 10 to the minus 6 for, uh, for BPSK. So this is, in other words, given, right? So if I have this given, then I can, and I know what my chip rate and my bit rate are, I can estimate how large the queue can be, how many of the users can I fit in there before I have too many so that nobody can communicate. Now, in here, we, we uh, simplify, I believe, for large Q, we can say for large Q, we can assume the two simplifying assumptions. First one is Q minus 1 times C, I shouldn't say convolution, times C is going to be much greater than NT, right? Your signals, you know, because they're all piled up in the same band, I'm going to assume that they're going to be much larger, that Q of them are going to be much larger than the thermal noise. And then the second is Q for large Q, Q minus 1 is approximately equal to Q. If Q is 50, then 49 is the same as 50. Now, if you use these two assumptions, here's, here's what you end up with. Signal to noise ratio and the output. ends up being 10 log, let's see here. You see what, when uh, I neglected NT relative to the Q minus 1 times C, and then C and C cancels, 
and then q is much one is much smaller than q, so this becomes tan log of q here, right? So this is equal to tan log of one over q plus tan log of R C over R B, and then from here you get um, this is of course tan log of R C over R B minus tan log of Q. And you end up with uh, Q being 10 to the 0 0.1 times of tan log of R C over R B minus S T. Now you get the capacity of how many users you can fit in the transformer. If you're given your spreading factor, your processing gain, and you know what is the signal to noise ratio that you need to provide in the output, this is dictated by the type of the modulation scheme and desired bit error rate that you're trying to provide, then you can easily calculate how many users you're able to put on the transponder before, before they start uh, being uh, before, before the this transponder ends up being uh, saturated to the point where you cannot, uh, you cannot uh, uh, communicate anymore. I, I, get, I guess there's a simplification here even further. If you take these two terms, that this is 10 to the log RC over RB. So I can, I can write that as well. This ends up being 10 to the log of RC over RB times 10 to the minus 0.1 S to N out. Right. And this gives you, this is just a RC over RB times 10 to the S to N out over 10. So that's the so that's the another formula. This is the same formula as the one that I have up there. So let me go through a, a, an example, and uh, just uh, what we need to look for here is two things. First, capacity: how many users I can fit. But also, uh, also what we need to look at is what is the end spectral efficiency that they're getting from? This? You know, it does this benefit use of it? I mean, do we have any real benefits from, from uh, CDMA? One, let me just uh, uh, say up front, we already observed that we have one definite benefit, and this is there is less overhead on synchronizing. You don't have to synchronize anybody. It's very easy to access the system, right? All that the Earth station needs to do is to transmit, right? As long as it's with transmitting within a power limit, it will, it will be able to you know, uh, use the transponder. As long as the number of the users in the transponder is smaller than Q, everything is going to be fine. So joining this system is very easy. right? So that's the definite benefit. What we need to look at is whether this particular scheme gives us the same kind of uh, spectral efficiency as we get in TDMA and FDM. So let me first do an example. Uh, looking into capacity of, of such system. I sort of have a question that's kind of related. Yes. Um, when you're multiplying by the uh, PN sequence and then you're filtering it, uh, is that the same as uh, essentially integrating and dumping? I mean, essentially yeah. you do that, right? That's 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 the that's the taking a dot product. You know, a lot of times we call them integrate and dump. And this is what if you look at the slide. Because I know like you're looking at orthonormal, so you integrate with the orthonormal with up with one and integrate with the Where is the dump part coming from, right? The what, what what is it that you need to dump, right? Uh, uh, you have to uh, you have to approach this bit by bit, right? So every bit is going to be encoded by the proper code. Like in this case, instead of sending this one, I had to send this one, 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 one. If I were to send use PN sequence instead of 
sending this one, I would send this entire PN sequence, let's say 15 chips here. So then my spreading would be 15 to 1. If I use a longer PN sequence, I might send 64 or 128 or even 1,000 and something chips for every bit. Now, where is the integration part come? You have to take whatever signal is coming and you multiply that by the proper PN sequence and you have to wait for the entire PN sequence before you decide whether it was 1 or, or, or minus 1 that has been sent. So you integrate over duration, duration of the PN sequence. At that point, you have completed integration. It's either greater than 0 or it's smaller than 0. It, it, you make a decision on what was the bit that you have received and you have to reset the whole process. At that point, you dump everything that you integrated and start all, start all over again. So you're going to integrate over the next uh, number of, of chips to you know, whatever is the length of your spreading sequence. You make a decision, you integrate, make a decision, and so on. This process here, it's called integrate and dump you know, in, a, in a lot of times in literature. Uh, in a, if you were more mathematical, you would say you're taking the product. If you are a stress spectrum engineer, you would say, I'm despreading my sequence. I mean, all of these are synonyms for essentially the same operation, right? You're getting, getting rid of the, the envelope, which is your PN sequence, and getting back your bits. But you're right, this is integrate and dump. Be, be also cognizant, you don't have to integrate and dump this little bit large, uh, broader term, because you don't have to have a spread spectrum to talk in terms of integrate and dump. Integrate and dump may happen at the output of your match filter. So you have your uh, symbol and you have your match filter. You integrate up to the symbol period. You accumulate the energy. You make your decision and you dump everything to, to start the new symbol. You know, I'm, I'm not referring this to a spread spectrum, but it's a trivial case of a spread spectrum where your spreading is equal to 1. Right? So, this is kind of also spread spectrum, but with no spreading, right? So you can understand it in that context as well. Does that give you an SNR program? Mm -hmm. I mean, essentially, if you're you're multiplying it by your PN sequence and then just filtering it, and then you put your integrator at the end, does that improve your SNR at all? That that integrator that uh, we talk about yeah. is your no pass filter. Okay. What is the what is the uh, okay? So what is the what is what does integrator do, right? Let's just uh, look at the zero to t, right? Dt, right? So let's uh, let's look at the frequency response of this guy. Here with the pulse, what do you get at the other? One. One. You. Right? <coughs> you. Right? So. So what is the what is the Fourier transform of this guy? Cosine. Cosine. Come on. Delta. Fourier transform. Look at this. It's one, right? Are you one, right? And what is the what is the Fourier transform of this one? One over j over right? But that's without without dumping, right? When you dump it, you actually go to zero, right? So the impulse response of this is u of t, u of t minus capital T, right? You know, that's the dumb part. So now, if you look at what does this, this does, it is e, e 1 minus e to the minus j, 2 pi, or j omega t, let me stick to that, right? So this is an impulse response of an integrate, right? Now, you're all skillful enough to do the following math. You can say that this is e to the a j omega t over 2 <coughs> minus e to the minus j omega t over 2 divided by j 2 omega t over 2. I can put 1 t here and then put e to the minus j omega t over 2 over here. See what I did? Just transform this into this. I took this out. There is this 1 it became this. This is the half. So this is this guy. Here I multiply by t over 2, add 2 and put t over here. So they're the same, right? So this is t. What is this guy? Sink. Excellent. Sink of omega 
t over 2, right? And uh, e to the minus j omega t over 2. Sink. The nature of the sink is what? It's a low pass filter, right? Yeah. The, the way how the sink looks like, it is letting whatever is between minus 1 over t and 1 over t go through, and then it, everything else is being attenuated, right? So this integrated and dump is essentially your low pass filter. So you may not find the, the low pass filter there. It's, it's embedded in the integrated and dump of, uh, uh, operation, right? So that's how you redistribute the energy. Right? Good question on my part, right? <laughs> well, I wish you, you picked out the answers too, right? Because you know all of this, all of this you've seen many times, right? I mean, the, the thing about our field is, you know, and, and hopefully some of you might end up being where I am today, and then you will discover that in every class you go, you're teaching the same thing, right? You just uh, have this, you just you have this elephant, right? That you're looking at from different sides, right? You know, today I might be talking about a tail, and in the next class I might be talking about uh, the ears and so on. But it's all the same, same knowledge, and that makes it a little bit easier, but also hard because you cannot hit the reset after any one of these courses, right? You have to know the stuff. If you hit the reset of the circuit theory, two, you suffer tremendously, right? Because we still haven't got out of circuit theory in a lot of these, a lot of these problems, right? We're still rehashing the, the, the frequency response and J omega and all that stuff, right? So let me go back to our, to our example. So here's the, here's the example we have. We have a, a, a direct sequence spread spectrum. Now, Spread spectrum, in general, is a technique where your bandwidth that you use for transmission is much, much larger than the basement, right? That's called spread spectrum. And there are various ways you can do that. The two most common ones are what they call frequency hopping and direct sequence spread spectrum. Frequency hopping is used in terrestrial networks quite often. It's not used in satellite. We, when we talk about spread spectrum in satellite, we're exclusively talking about core division, direct sequence spreading. Uh, spreading uh, uh, spread spectrum. So this is your example 681. It says the direct sequence spread spectrum CDMA has number of worst stations sharing uh, transponder 54 megahertz KA transponder. Um, each station uses uh, PN sequence, so the end of your PN sequence is 1023. So, uh, so how large is your processing gain here? It's 10 log of, of this, which is 30 dB. So you have 30 dB that, that you can use at the reception point to improve the signal over the surrounding noise and interference coming from other users. The transmitter in the, in the receiver use, uh, I don't know why it's this important, but TX and RX use root raised cosine pulse with alpha equals 0 0.5. That's your roll-off factor. Um, the chip rate, RC, is equal to 30 megahertz. It has to be smaller than this because it needs to fit within the transponder. It cannot be larger than the, than the 54 megahertz. Determine the number of earth stations. So determine Q. If signal to noise at the output needs to be 12 dB. Right? That's the part A. And part B is, it's not in the example, but I, I just added it as determine spectrum efficiency efficiency of the scheme. How many bits per hertz can you fit in this transponder band? You know how. What is the what is the uh, bang for a buck? You know you're paying with the spectrum. How much of the data rate you can get through that spectrum? Right. And, and whether you are 
you, you, it's, it's beneficial to you to use spread spectrum. So the first question is very easy to answer. We had that Q is going to be your RC over RB times your 10 to the signal to noise ratio in the output divided by 10. That's the formula that I just <coughs> Sorry, I think we minus. need a minus sign. Uh, minus here. Mm -hmm. Did I make a mistake here as well? Yeah. Thank you for catching me. So, so if you substitute here, uh, you end up that this is 6441. So approximately 64 users can, can use this system. So you can have 64 users that are communicating through this transponder, you know, with a uh, with uh, 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 through this through this transponder. Now, what are what would be an example of this? Well, think about where it's of your benefit to have an easy access of an end user that has a relatively low data. Satellite phones, right? If you have a phone that is that you use for a voice call, voice is a relatively low data rate service. You know, we compress voice to around 10 kilobits per second. So if you now have a transponder and antenna that illuminates portion of the, of the globe, then you can service 64 users in that, in that uh, portion. And then if you have multiple transponders and then multiple beam antennas, you can reuse that whole spectrum for in a CDMA mode to provide satellite telephony. Or you can use this for what is called satellite on the move, where you put the satellite on a on, a, on a vehicles or, or you know, uh, everything that is kind of moving around and about in a given area uh, and you want it to be able to access the, the transponder easily without too much overhead required for synchronization or frequency management. That's the, that's the beautiful aspect of this scheme. Now, let's look at the spectral efficiency. This is where, where you see what is the price you pay. For everything there is a price. So what's the spectral efficiency? Well, let's calculate the bit rate that you can support for a given user. Now, you're given that your chip rate is 30 megahertz, so it's going to be your chip rate divided by the, end, the length of your spreading sequence. Because remember, for every bit, you're sending all of the entire PN sequence. So if your sequence is 1,023 chips, then every bit is worth 1,023 chips. So you're Bit rate is going to be whatever is your chip rate divided by the length of your spreading sequence. In our case, this becomes 30 times 10 to the 6 chips per second divided by uh, 1,023 uh, chips per bit. Right? And it gives you a data rate of 29.3 kilobits per second. So this is what I can give to each individual user, right? And uh, I can have 64 of these guys. So my total rate is going to be the number Q times your bit rate, which in our case is going to be 64 users times 29.3 kilobits per second, which gives you a net data rate of 1.876 megabits per second. Your spectral efficiency is going to be your total rate divided by the bandwidth of your transponder. So it becomes 1.876 megabits per second divided by your 54 megahertz. So that gives you a special efficiency of 0.0. .0 three, four, eight bits per second at every hertz of the band. Now, is, how, is, how does this number look like? Is this small or large? What's your take on this? Do you have a feel? What do, what do terrestrial systems get? Like what, what cellular networks get? <laughs> Right. This is very low. This is very low, right? The cellular, like in, in LTE or, or those contemporary, they boast of having like three, four, five bits per second per every hertz of spectrum that you get. 
This is less than 1 over, what would this be, around 1 over 40, or let's say 1 over 30. Uh, uh, so for every 30 hertz, you're delivering one bit of data, right? So this is really, really pitiful in terms of efficiency. But it has its advantage, you know, it has advantage that it's really easy to access on the go. It is, it is, uh, it is very easy to, uh, uh, you know, for the earth stations to utilize the system. But this kind of gives you already limitations here, and you're not going to use CDMA for large backhaul, you know, internet or data traffic or even voice traffic, where you're having, you know, uh, uh, a lot of lot of data to send. You're going to use it in some special circumstances that that are where the the premium that you're looking for is easy access to the system, right? So that, that you don't have to specially coordinate individual users. So we can use this for GPS, for example? Uh, so that means that we don't send a lot of data on yeah. GPS? Yeah, we use it for GPS in two, for two reasons. All right, let me first explain why. Uh, you don't have a lot of data, right? But that's not the main reason. We use it for GPS for precisely the processing gain. Now, why is processing gain uh, so precious to us? Because it allows us to detect very, very weak signals. We can pull them out of the noise. GPS signals can, uh, I mean, they're coming from the satellites, and they're, they're, they're very weak. But, you know, by integrating them over a longer period of time, you can actually have your large processing gain and then uh, see those signals. And that's how CDMA actually started. You know, the, the motive for, for having a CDMA is to be able to communicate below the thermal noise. Because if you take your signal and you spread it over large uh, frequency range, you know, it becomes so small in power spectral density that its density is smaller than the noise. So if you look at this area on a spectrum analyzer, you see nothing, right? But then you convolve this against the PN sequence, and you redistribute the energy, and all of a sudden you see your signal coming up. And that accomplishes two things. First, it allows you to detect very weak signals. The second thing it accomplishes is by positioning your PN sequence, you actually can detect very precisely the timing where this signal has arrived, right? You can you can say, okay, if I have if I have all of these satellites that are synchronized, and they're all sending the same <coughs> sequence, then I slide my local uh, replica of that sequence, and I detect when do I align with these satellites. So I say, oh, this is the signal from that satellite. Then I move my sequence. That's the signal from this guy. That's the signal from that guy. If I know the exact location of these satellites and the distances that the signals travel, and I can estimate those by looking at where does this PN sequence align, I can triangulate where my position is. And that's that's so we use the use this in, in, in a GPS for two reasons: being able to detect low low uh, low power signals, low power spectral density signals, and the second being able to uh, get exact timing reference when did this, how long did this take for the signal to travel from the satellite to the position on the ground. And by doing so, it allows us to locate precisely our location, right? The GPS right now is very, very good because uh, it was good to begin with, but uh, as of uh, beginning of the century, we, we, we moved it into, they used to introduce a jitter in the timing just to, so that you couldn't locate yourself precisely. Now that's removed. And you've seen that it actually can locate you within, a, within a, I guess, less than a meter, right? It can be very, very precise. So for the number of users, is it important where the, the users are located on average? No, no. That, that's a very good point because I didn't talk. That, that was in that derivation that I kind of just. <coughs> but let me use your question to highlight. Remember? I said that uh, this is the equation that, that I wrote. I said S to M and the output was 10 log 
of your carrier over there was mt here, let me just put the rest of the equations, 10 log of your rc over R, rb. And then here I had a term that I'm going to call i. That's the interference coming from all the other users in the system. The interference is going to be sum of all, let me go call this c i user, right? All uh, i all j, let's say where j is different than i, or cj, right? All the other users were that, that are not this guy, all the other users. Now, what I did in, in the derivation, I said this is q minus 1 times ci. And what I assume by doing that, I assume that all the other users are power managed so that they all arrive at the transponder with approximately the same power. Now, what that, you, you can see that this is not something that happens on its own. It is something that has to be carefully orchestrated. And in CDMA system, the, one of its vital aspects is the power control. The, the, uh, the users need to be managed so that they decrease their power or increase their power based on where they are located on, on the Earth. And if you're closer to the satellite or you have more favorable position, you're going to be, you're going to reduce your transmit power. If you're further away from the satellite or, or your position, you know, the propagation conditions are unfavorable, you have to increase your power. They're all managed so that they arrive at the transponder with the same power. Right? And uh, that, I don't know exactly in, in, in some commercial systems what it is, but it can be many times a second that you adjust your transmit power to make sure that you are arriving in the sun, right? that, that all, they're all arriving approximately at the same time. Right? So that's, that's a very important aspect. And, and, uh, and to answer your question, even though the position of them can be different, their power is adjusted so that from the standpoint of the transponder and all the other receivers on the ground, they are essentially of the same power. Is this the same as in cellular? It's exactly the fairness same. Fairness scheduling? Yeah. It's not fairness scheduling. It's, it's, a, it's a man radio resource management. You have to manage them so that you maximize the capacity. All right, so this completes our course. All right, that's the end of what we are able to cover this year. Uh, next, next uh, term on uh, on Thursday, I'm just going to be doing problems. So use a couple of things that we have until Thursday to go over the stuff we covered in this chapter and have your questions ready. And then the following week on Tuesday, we're going to have a test. That's it.